Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, Liz Piccarazzi, Jennifer Karen, and Sarah Siegel talk about whether they ever wish they could go back to their corporate lives. For Liz, there was a period during the early days of COVID. For Jennifer, it was when she made the transition from a consulting business to an employee business. These days, none of them can imagine going back, although Sarah did have a rough week recently when she lost two clients. It's just the way of the world, she tells us. When businesses are looking to cut costs, it's outside agencies that go first. But when it's two of your largest clients in the span of a week, it's like, really? Can I go dig a hole, put myself in it, and just stay there forever? What she's actually doing, as we discuss, is figuring out some new ways to attract more clients. We also discuss whether everyone needs a business plan and whether the three owners ever wonder if someone else would do a better job running their businesses. Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations, brought to you by our principal sponsor, The Great Game of Business, will let owners know they are not alone in facing challenges. Same thing with our daily newsletter, The 21 Hats Morning Report, which Inc. Magazine named the best newsletter for business owners and which you can subscribe to for free at 21hats.com. We can also find transcripts of our podcast episodes and lots of other articles and interviews. Joining me this week on the podcast are regulars Jennifer Karen, who is CEO of SB Expos and Events, an events management business based near Baltimore, Maryland. Liz Picarazzi, who's CEO of City Bin, which is based in Brooklyn, New York, and makes trash enclosures and package bins. And Sarah Siegel, who's founder and CEO of Siegel Communications, a public relations firm based in San Francisco. The episode is titled, Can I Go Dig a Hole? Welcome, Jennifer, Liz, Sarah. It's great to have you all here. The three of you have much in common, including the fact that you've all been very generous about sharing the ups and downs of your journeys here on this podcast, which leads me to the question I'd like to start with today. You know, none of you had to start a business. And I'm just curious, especially when you're struggling with something, do you ever regret it? Do you ever think about going back to your corporate careers or doing something else? How about you, Liz? So it's interesting that you asked because I used to work at an American Express and yesterday I was at an event at a restaurant in the same complex as American Express. And I was very, um, I was really reminiscing about my times there and the people that I met and how when I went to happy hours, you know, with all my Amex colleagues, it was mostly all corporate types. But then I was there with a group of entrepreneur women. There were around 12 of us. And I talked last night about how I got a lot out of corporate. But one of the most important things I got was I understood how much friction there is in getting anything done. And for an entrepreneur, you're looking for traction. And when you encounter friction, you're going to try to find 10 ways to get through or to get around it or get above it. The impression that for me, with like a corporate company, it's not just an Amex thing, is that there's a lot of friction in getting anything done. So if you're, you know, doing an eight hour day and you're in meetings for six of those, which often happen with me, um, it's really hard to get things done. And it's very um, agitating for an entrepreneur, you know. So for me, I always kind of felt like a black sheep there. I felt like everybody else knew how the hierarchy worked and kind of how politics worked. Um, And I don't mean that in a negative way. I understand in corporations why there is hierarchy. I really actually do. But I just, I, I couldn't play that game. I wasn't very good at it. I like to do things that I'm good at. And I ultimately felt like I needed to do something that was more creative. As it turns out with me, I had business plan written for my first business before I left Amex. Um, And I was affected by the layoffs and due to the recession. And so I ended up leaving, but having that business plan in my back pocket and being able to start the business right away. And that's a story for another day, what that transition was like. But, um, you know, and in terms of where I have regretted it, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, when I had laid off all my employees and didn't know if PPP was really happening and had a warehouse full of inventory that I had just brought over and was paying tons to house that. I, you know, I think, you know what, if I was in corporate, I definitely would not have this problem. And 
I just had to have hope that we got through it and we did. And I feel like the government was incredibly generous with small businesses. I definitely would not have survived had I not gotten that PPP. So I guess if, if things had gone really south, then I probably would want to have a corporate job right now. Jennifer, how about you? I think I definitely did um, between years five through eight. When I started the company in 2009, it was really supposed to be started as a consulting firm, not as a business, because I love what I do. I have a definite vision of how associations can optimize their events and love it, love every aspect of it. And in the beginning, it was just me working by myself, so more of a consultancy than a business. I was totally fine. But when I got to the point of creating the business, hiring staff, doing more complicated accounting, getting more things to build the structure, I didn't like it. And I really regretted it. And I thought, why did I do this? I could have worked for a consulting firm. I could have worked for an association. This is stupid. This is taking up all my time. My kids were little. I hate it, hate it, hate it. I pushed through it. How how long did that last? Three years. (laughs) But what I should have done is earlier on, embraced that if I was going to run a business, I should have sought outside help at that moment. Instead, I languished in misery for a couple of years. And and if I had said, okay, this is now not a consulting firm. I've decided to be a business. Here's the different options for resources. There's books, there's podcasts, there's CEO advisory groups out there. There's free things from the state. Years later, I got some amazing courses through um, Maryland's uh, Small Business Development Corporation that were free, go to that. I should have done that instantly to help me design my way. I had a vision, but I was very lost on the business side. Once I got through it, I was fine. Then I I love it. I would never go back. I absolutely adore it now. But um, if you fall into starting a business without thinking that it's a business and you get lost, find the outside resources. That's what helped me get out of that stage. What was it that you most needed to do differently during that difficult period? Stop thinking I had to know everything, right? You had to, I should have gotten, like I didn't understand accounting and I should have hired um, a part-time accountant to set up QuickBooks online for me much sooner than I did. I couldn't, I knew how to do the work, but I didn't know how to, um, hire an employee. I could have gotten some help to say, this is how you hire your first employee. This is what you do with them. And then how to delegate work uh, and sort of management because now you're not in the phase of just doing the work. You need to manage someone else's work. If I had gotten help on those two things, that would have helped me to the next level because I, I love sales. I, that was easy to me. You know what I should have done? I should have read E-Myth a lot sooner. I love that book. Favorite book of business of all time. And I should have read that day one. Sarah, you've shared with us, you've had multiple previous careers or incarnations. <laughs> Do you ever miss them? Well, all, no, they're all in communication. So the, the consistency of my career is like, I've been in the communication industry for a really long time. And so whether or not it's as a reporter on one side of the fence or the person talking to a reporter, it's still communications. I was just thinking back, I had, I had uh, drinks with an old colleague of mine from Cafe Press, which was a print-on-demand company that was pretty big at the time that got absorbed by an, another larger entity. And, you know, I, the people that I worked with there, like, we're still all in contact. We follow each other and, and communicate with each other on a regular basis because the one thing that we liked about having that, that time period was the creativity that we were afforded and always kind of kept on our toes is really fast pace. And it was really nice having that comfort that um, someone else was paying the bills and I didn't have to worry about that because that can be suffocating sometimes for me um, as a business owner, like where I'm so focused on, you know, generating new business or, you know, expanding the business or this and that, that I forget about the creative side of what we do and and why we do it. So um, I'm actually working with my team to do this pretty large creative project um, that I will divulge at some point soon that just, it's not for a client. It's for us to kind of 
get our juices flowing, you know, and, and, and really kind of share the creativity that we have. Because, you know, when you work in PR, a lot of the times you're like, you'll, you'll give a client, you know, 15 amazing ideas. And then they, they generally go for what's safe. <laughs> and so we have this like laundry list of really awesome ideas that never get picked up, but sometimes you just got to do them yourself. Um, I just want to point out one thing is I love that Liz had a business plan before she started her business. I still don't have a business plan. I'm like working on it slowly, but I still haven't been able to figure out kind of what my end goal is because I don't really have an end goal. I just, you know, I like what I do, but like, is it a monetary goal? Probably not. Is it, you know, an accolades goal? Probably not. So, or is it like, how big are we? Probably not. So I can't really figure, I haven't been able to like, it really kind of figure out what that is. But in terms of going back to like a a corporate um, environment, I don't think I could because I don't think I'm employable. I think that Jay said that on a podcast once or in conversation, but I, I don't think I'm employable. He said you were an employable? Well, somebody said like, they said it about themselves. And I was like, you know what? I'm not employable. Like, I don't like marching to the beat of somebody else's drum. I can, I am always looking for how can we do things better? How can we change things? How can we move ahead? And a lot of bigger entities aren't um, built that way. They, they don't want to test drive new ideas. So I would phrase it a little bit differently. I think you're probably quite employable, but you might not be a great employee, which is probably true of everybody on this podcast. Yeah. I, I just, I, I mean, I'm never satisfied with kind of what's being done. And I always want to make something different and, and do something um, inspired. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that, that don't need to do that because they have a great product that is a commodity, but that, that people note their brand name. And I just don't think I would fit well into that environment anymore. I'm actually hearing, Sarah, that you kind of want to maximize creativity. Oh, I do. I've kind of put myself in a little bit of a funk because I've been so focused on business. We had two of our largest clients. Um, we're wrapping up with them at the end of this month because of financial bandwidth on their side. Like literally both of them are like, we love you guys. We're going to come back, but we need to like take a break and, and get our ducks in a row and, you know, get more funding or, or do what, what they need to do to make really good use of us. But like, we love them. Like we think they're great. We think that what they do is really interesting and awesome. And we're so excited when we get media hits and opportunities for them. So when they leave, I, you know, I, I try not to, but I take it personally. Cause like, I feel like I've failed the, the team. And then I'm like, like spend so much time. Like I say, how am I going to make the, the numbers work? What do we have new business in the pipeline? Like, and then I focus all my energy on that. And I forget about the creat the creative side that got me into this business. And so I'm really trying to step back and go, you know what? If if we do what we're good at and we show the world how creative we are, specifically in the video realm, people will come to us. And and uh, and so um, I'm investing a little bit of, of money into like starting to create that that video content like we already edit video for clients and and do all of that but like original content is kind of what we we want to focus on for the next you know the next while Sarah one of the things that um that helped me get out of my i don't know couple years of doubting and regretting that I had started a business was creating a business plan and i wonder if that would help it it gave me a, a sense of control it gave me a way to direct my energies that didn't make me seem like I was drowning. I'm wondering, I mean, Liz, you started off the right way because I think if I ever started another business, the first thing I would do is create a business plan. I'm wondering, if Sarah, if that... Because it's, it's sad when, when you lose clients like that, really sad. And I'm wondering if that might help you move forward. Yeah. No, I mean, I have, I have a document that's my quote unquote business plan, right? And I... And I I go into it and I work on it as I can. It's kind of a work in progress. Probably would be good to like have somebody else put eyes on it at some point um, when it's a little bit more finished. But like, again, um, in, for some reason, I'm stuck on this idea that a business plan has to have an end goal. I'm not sure you're right about that. Mm, I don't think so. 
I think it's really more about the process, you know, and if you get your plan on paper, you can really ask the question, will people pay for what I'm offering? Yes, no, how much? A lot of work to get there. But I think a lot of people, when they do business plans, work out a lot of things that they would encounter, you know, once they launch. And those are good things to know. And they can be short. When you put together your plan, Liz, how far into the future were you thinking? Was it the first year or to the to, to establishing, you know, some stability? I think I probably did it for like three to five years. At least half of what I predicted was wrong, um, which is fine. I which mean, is probably a pretty good batting average by most standards, I suspect. Yeah. I mean, everything from, you know, classifying employees as 1099 or W-2 to how I was going to price things, who my design target was for customers changed multiple times, but it, it still will narrow down, you know, your choices and that, you know, you're going to find a hundred books about how to write a business plan. Just kind of look at which are the couple that are the best on Amazon and look for something that's short. I've even seen a book, I think it's called The One Page Business Plan. And I think for a lot of people, that's kind of the way to go. And it forces you to, to ask questions and answers that you might not otherwise do. Have you ever thought about going back and updating your plan? No, I haven't because it's just so many years back. My first business, that plan was written in like 2008 or something. And then for my current business, City Bin. That was actually written in conjunction with starting it because I was spinning it off of the handyman business. Um, and then the other thing I would actually recommend, which you may even already know about, is the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. Um, I did that six or seven years ago, but they have satellites at universities in many cities. And that's something that Goldman Sachs actually pays for the whole curriculum. It's like a six-month commitment I think it's like one day a month in person, but every component of a business plan, there's like an entire unit devoted to it. So you'll get all, everything with, you know, the financials, the marketing, you know, operations, hiring, firing, HR, you, you name it. That was really good for me. And actually, I created Citibin within that Goldman Sachs class because I realized I wanted to spin it off from the handyman business and get out. So I actually planned my exit from my first business in that program. Interesting. I also did, it's very similar to the Goldman Sachs. I did the Small Business Administration's Emerging Leaders Program. That's a nine-month program where they meet every two weeks. It's at night, so it's like two and a half hours. And it's the same thing, curriculum. Every month is a different sort of chapter. They have a, a leader who teaches as well as bringing in some guest speakers. And then you do a presentation at the end very similar concept to Liz, and they help you at the end of it, you had to write a business plan and a sales and marketing plan to support it. I, I'm like, Liz, change my plan. I add to it. Let's say mine's two years. There's the initial, what the company is going to be. But as things have developed over the last 14 years, uh, especially with the arrival of us getting so involved with event technology support that I have changed it, right? Um, I think the first thing it helped me to do, though, is not chase any business that came my way. When I actually put down a business plan of writing, I was able to say no to potential or current clients when they asked me for services that I didn't think were in my wheelhouse. Because before, when I was just sort of trying to make it through, sometimes I accepted some work that I, I shouldn't have, that wasn't in my core strength. And that business plan really helped me to focus on my core strength. Kind of like Pilates for business. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how do you mean it's like Pilates for business? Just, oh, core strength. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Okay. I do Pilates once a week. Maybe I need to do this more. <laughs> Can I ask Lauren? Lauren, I, you know, you ask us questions all the time about um, our, our businesses. Uh-oh. But, you know, you run a small business. Um, do you have a business plan? Um, no, I don't. And I, I probably should. You know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go too deep into this right now, but I've been kind of throwing things against the wall to see what sticks, what sticks, and what might be a potential revenue source for me. The, the newsletter, sponsorship of the podcast, uh, in-person meeting, a couple other ideas that I have. 
And I, I feel like I've needed to try these things out and get a sense of whether they work at all. And I'm thinking that, you know, maybe next year I need to, to really put it down on paper and, and have a real plan. Seriously, I have an idea for you. Um, you need to host a series of webinars that people can sign up and pay for where you break down, you know, whatever the questions are for the business plan and literally talk through those and people have to go away and do homework and come back. And it's almost like create like a peer group of people that are in your situation and my situation to like kind of put light a fire under them. I guarantee 50% of business owners out there, if not more, don't have business plans. And it's, it's one of those things that they wish they had and they know they should have, but it's, you know, putting pen to paper is easier said than done. I actually have a little bit of a coffin for my first business. It's just a box in my office <laughs> where I put all of the things that died when that business died. <laughs> and one of the things in there is the business plan. Wow. You know, postcards I created and sent and various things. It's almost like a scrapbook. But I was like, I can't get rid of this business plan, even though half of it or more was totally wrong. But every once in a while, I'll pull that out. And they're like a little memento. Jennifer, I'm, you, you mentioned that you did an original plan and that you uh, you update it. Do you update it based on changes in the business or do you think about it once a year or once every two years? I would say I update it every two years. Theoretically, it's a plan for three years, but I never make it through three years. And the two-year plan is the core, the mission and vision. And then it talks about where we're going to focus the majority of our efforts. Um, the last two years has been focused heavily on scalable structure. I always have a theme with it too. So it's a strategic plan that underlines the business plan. The business plan to me is the, how is this engine running, right? I have my customers, I have my structure, I have how I'm going to make money. So maybe I'm updating my strategic plan every two years to tie into the business plan. But in the beginning, in the beginning, I started the business with associations as my core customer, but I started taking other work. And when I wrote the business plan, I said, nope, I only want to work with associations. I'm not taking corporate clients. I'm not going to take government clients. It helped me focus very specifically on events and the event revenue for association conventions. To what extent, Jennifer, is it strategic and, and you kind of text? And to what extent is it financial and, and numbers looking at, you know, what you charge, what your revenue will be, how much money you'll actually make? So there's definitely uh, revenue goals um, and uh, profit, net profit and gross profit goals that tie into a pipeline. So I have, I don't have great KPIs on what my pipeline should be but I'm getting there. So if I want to do 20% increase this year, how big does my pipeline need to be? And if it starts to fall below, I'm not going to get it because I know on average, I get about 40% of all of our proposals that we send out, we get 40% that turn into clients. There's definitely financial side. And then there's um, a lot of infrastructure in that plan of, um, I do forecasting with my CFO. So Okay, we think based on this revenue goal, we should hire one full uh, FTE, full time employee. Where would that be? Let's think it through. This sounds like I'm way more organized than I am, but it's definitely over the course of like two months, every couple years, two years that I that I put this to paper. Because if I don't put it to paper, it won't get done. Right? It'll stay in my head. It doesn't get communicated. It forces me to put my plan to paper. And then say, okay, nope, I agreed. I'm only focusing on association. That was years ago, right? This time now, I'm, I'm adding two new services. How am I going to do that? This is how I'm going to do it. Sarah, I'd like to go back to the, uh, the clients you were talking about. You, you said that you, know, you, you parted on good terms with them, but you still feel kind of a sense of responsibility for it. Did you learn anything from it? Do you think you could have done something different or was it purely the, their experience? It was purely their experience. I mean, there was nothing we could have done. Like literally they, it's all been all accolades, like how much they like working with us and how um, great the team is. It's just a, a financials. And so, you know, it's not the first time um, that we've had to ebb and flow with clients based on their financials. It's just 
you know, it's the way of the world, like businesses are, are looking to cut costs. It's outside agencies that go first, right? But, you know, when it's two of your largest clients in the span of a week, <laughs> that's tough. It, it's like, really, can I go dig a hole and put myself in it and just stay there forever and make, until it goes away? It's kind of crushing, you know, because literally a week before that, I was like, wow, we're on good track. My PL looks great. Like these are all good things. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, um, not so good. <laughs> um, and getting those big clients is a lot of work. Um, and we, I just found out yesterday we had, we had submitted a last minute proposal through a, a connection of ours to work on a very large city project for San Francisco. And we found out yesterday that we didn't win it because they were going with an agency that was bigger. But like that, literally that was the reason. The, that agency doesn't have as many staff in San Francisco as we do, but because they had like big name brands, like they had worked for familiar, more familiar brands. That's the reason that they're going with them. They're going with what's safe. You know, we're not on the radar yet of larger brands or household name brands. We're still in the smaller regional businesses, which is good. And we like it a lot, but, you know, having those bigger um, companies with stable sources of revenue that aren't going to look at you and say, Hey, we ran out of funding. <laughs> Got to cut back for a while. Would be a nice goal. It would be nice to get those. So I need to spend a lot of time kind of figuring out how to put myself in front of those, those potential potential people. And it's like, you know, going to conferences, speaking more, more contributed content. It's the thought leadership because it's, it's go where they go. Sarah, I'm curious, do you ever um, work as a sub on like, let's say it's a, like an advertising agency, let's say like going beyond just the regular marketing into the PR realm for big brands. Is that ever a way that you can kind of get on to a larger brand's work? It is. We're looped in with a, a handful of marketing agencies. Most of those marketing agencies don't have like the big, um, the big, big clients. So I have started sourcing out and just trying to get on the radar of some of the other larger advertising and marketing agencies. Because a lot of marketing agencies, like you go to their website and they'll be like, oh, we do marketing and we do PR. And then you look at their headcount. And they have like one person that does PR. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, okay, so you don't really do PR. You say that you do PR, but you don't really do PR. The only way to to get in there is is getting acquainted with the these folks and and introducing yourself as a as a as a sub. But yeah, we're we've done that in the past for sure, just not for any like super major brand yet. No. I mean, like there are big brands that we do work for, like, for example, like Birdies is a, a national shoe company and we work for them because we were brought in through their creative agency. And so we actually edit all of their digital advertising video. Really random, but like it's a capability that we have and we're very good at it. And so um, we just turn that around for them. Sarah, have you rethought your marketing strategy at all in light of losing these two clients or are you doing anything different? Um, oh, I am. I am. Like, um, so, <laughs> um, this kind of just happened over the last couple of weeks, but, um, we do a lot of grand openings for, um, our clients. So a lot of brick and mortar stuff where they're opening a new location or whatever. And so we end up a lot of times working with the chambers of commerce for regions. And we, uh, in conversation with them have found that like we have a lot of you know knowledge that we can provide to the chamber memberships so we're going to be offering you know complimentary webinars and in person um uh sessions that focus on PR and media relations and social media management um for a handful of of chambers um in our region um and we're going to kind of test drive those um, and then just to kind of continue to just get our name out there. Um, you know, we are becoming known specifically in the Bay Area because we have so many Bay Area clients, but like literally the chambers are great and they're responsive and, and they, they work with every size business out there. So 
if we can continue just to like offer up, you know, something that's easy for us, like I'll talk about media relations until the cows come home and you don't have to pay me for that. So that's what we're <laughs> doing for, our, it's a, a new, new business thing in addition to some creative stuff that we're doing. Jennifer, have you ever hired PR help? I have not. We've talked extensively on the show about how marketing has been not really great for me. It's not been my strong suit and sort of ignored, but no, never done PR. I'm always interested in what Sarah has to say. <laughs> <laughs> Liz, you have. I'm, I'm curious, how did you find the people you've hired in the past? So I was in a kind of a, a women's entrepreneur group really early on. And one of the women in the group was starting her own you know, PR firm, a uh, husband and wife team also, which I'm very familiar with. And so I, interestingly, I was going to hire her for, I think the retainer was like 5,000 a month, which was definitely more than I could pay, but I still took the leap. And she got me in the New York Times, like immediately in that first month, which was a really big, big step for us. That was in like 2015, a long time ago. So in that situation, it was worth it. But what I will say is that you're supposed to like kind of continue on with the publicist for a couple months after that to kind of promote the publicity that you got. So I did a month, another month and I got literally nothing from it. And so I thought to myself, well, I aimed high and I got exactly what I wanted. Do I want to keep, keep going for it? At least at this stage. And I decided not. So I cut it off after the second month. Oh, wow. That's quick. Yeah, it was really quick. And I don't know if it was too quick. However, I am very good at PR. And I spend a lot of time on PR, even though I wouldn't like call myself, oh, I'm like part-time publicity like I am. And I enjoy doing it. Is it a good use of your time though? Um, because hmm. a lot of people are, I mean, PR is not brain surgery. <laughs> it's not. It can be, it's a oh, Although, let me you stop know you there, Sarah. What? I don't know about that, Sarah. That kind of undercuts what you do. No, then, I mean, it takes know? a lot. I mean, it takes time to learn how to do it and do it well. Yeah. Um, but the the, phys the physical acts of, of what we do are, are not super complicated. But, but it's not well understood. No, it's not. It's not. I would ask Liz, you know, you, you said they got you in the New York Times in the first month. That's kind of great. Well, but but why did that happen? Were, did they know something? Did they do PR really well? Or did you just have a good story to tell that hit the Times at the right time? How did that happen? So, Lauren, that's actually a good question because I think I may, it may have been that I had a really good story. And it's not, it still was totally worth paying it to get that. But I realized that a lot of like what was in, you know, the the release or whatever was like stuff that I probably could have written myself. But at the same time, I didn't really know how to work it. So our publicist, she had a contact in the real estate section of the New York Times, which is where it ran. So I guess I'm kind of talking about both sides of my mouth here. Well, that's valuable that she had connections and that made a difference. That's super valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I often just ask, if I were the journalist, what would I want? What information would I want to be able to decide to do this story, decide if it's interesting or decide I have the right media? So when I got really focused on doing that, it's almost like I feel like I'm sometimes feeding them the stories and about a huge percentage of it that ends up in the article will have come specifically from what I gave them, including the names of competitors and links to competitors. I realized that a while back that if you're writing to, you know, a publication that's going to look at a category, like let's say package lockers, you know, they're definitely going to be interested in what I have to say, but I think they were more interested because I made their job easier. They didn't have to research who my competitors were because I gave it to them. You want a job? Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, but here's it. But the, again, is it a good use of your time? Because yeah, you know how to do it, you know how to do it really well, but should you be doing it? And that's the, that's, we get a lot of yeah. clients where it's like, yeah, I know how to do this. I can talk to reporters, but should I be do, spending my time reaching out or should I offset this? Because it, it's time consuming. Yeah. I don't know. I kind of enjoy it. There are advantages to d doing it yourself. Uh, I would say, speaking as a as a journalist, I've developed relationships with people who reached out to me directly through the years uh, that have lasted for many years. And 
I don't, I don't think it would have necessarily happened, you know, if it had come through somebody else. Yeah, I've also, but I've heard from a lot of reporters that don't like working with businesses directly because um, most of them don't understand the timeline, the deadlines, the sure. the image requirements, the you know uh, how not to try to use it as a commercial. Like the like a lot of people will try, and we spend a lot of time working with clients, being like, no, you can't. If you want a piece of contributed content to run, you cannot be writing it like an advertisement as for your business. You have to put it in context. Like we work for the with a hotel and I'm like, yeah, we can get a travel reporter to come and write about the hotel, but they don't want to write just about the hotel. They're going to want to write about the whole region. So we're going to have to make friends with um, other hospitality providers and make it a whole thing. And they quickly got that. But it's it it's like what you said, you're you're pitching yourself, but you're pitching your vertical as well. You're giving people a heads up on other players in in the space, which, you know, can help and obviously hurt you in certain ways, but that's what they want. They want a trend story. They don't want to just write about one entity. Sarah, and we've had this conversation before uh, once or twice with Jay Goltz, where he has said that he's surprised that he doesn't get more pitches from PR firms directly reaching out to him. Have you thought more about just picking out businesses that you would like to work with and contacting them directly? Yeah, actually, um, I find that cold emailing doesn't work, though. I'm just going to tell you that much. Like my gut is I've definitely reached out and given case studies or like provided them with, hey, I saw this opportunity and thought of your brand. And those don't usually go anywhere unless there's a connection. But like, for example, we manage the social media accounts for a bunch of clients and this <laughs> this really cute company based in San Francisco reached out through our client's um, Instagram handle because um, they make custom branded dog toys. And so... Custom dog toys? Yeah, I know. It's weird, but it's it's called... I, can I say their name on this? Um, sure. Called Good Boy, spelled G O O D B O I, and they're based in San Francisco. And they created a prototype of a donut box and a donut, both of which are dog toys. Reached out to, through via Instagram to say, "Hey, who can we send this to to the donut well, company to consider?" Which I thought was super cute. So I reached out back to them, and I was like, um, "I got my staffer to get me their email," and I was like, "Hey, you know." You guys are small, you're up and coming, but I think what you think you're doing is really interesting. Um, you know, just love to grab a coffee or something and you know, put us on your radar for when you're ready. Um, we did that recently with a local distillery. And um, because one of my staffers went in and was like, Oh my god, this place is awesome and they don't do PR. And I was like, Okay. And so I reached out and said, Hey, we just wanna like be around for when you decide you want to invest in PR. And we got a meeting with them and sent them a proposal and I don't know if it's going to happen right away, but they know that we're there there now. And so that's kind of how I'm going about those. Mm -hmm. Well, and that could, they could also develop a budget in the future based on your quote. They may not have it now, but they could say, yeah, we're going to get this started in 2024. I think that's a really good approach. When they do their business plan. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. So I I think that cold doesn't work, but warm does. So um, I, I'm kind of work on the warm and that's why we're going to do the, the Chamber of Commerce stuff because it creates warm. We only have a little time left. Uh, Liz, last time you were here, uh, you told us that you were in the process of preparing a presentation for your EO group about imposter syndrome. And uh, I'm curious, uh, did you go ahead and give that presentation and how did it go? So I did give the presentation I did not know that you were going to ask, but that's okay, Lauren. I, I'm, I'm glad you asked. It's nice to reflect on it. So, you know, I've had a lot of growth in the company in the last couple of years, and I'm finding myself in a lot of situations that I feel like in over my head or things that I don't like to do that I need to do, anything that's, you know, legal or taxes or insurance, any related stuff like that. And so kind of figuring out what I'm good at and what I'm not good at has been really important because then I can acknowledge what I'm not good at and I can make sure that's delegated. And for I've made a lot of progress in the last year, like delegating more. 
so part of it was like figuring out what it good at it good at and bad at but then part of it is you know I've encountered a lot of new people in the last couple of years since we've been doing city work so one thing I distinguished in this presentation which I had a coach for is that there's a couple of situations I'm in where I feel really vulnerable in terms of like well what is my subject matter expertise you know I'm not an industrial designer or an architect, like what business do I have making trash enclosures? You know, these people have all their journals and their white papers all about how to do various forms of kind of public use goods. And not that I necessarily think that they should put City Bin in there, but I guess I'm sometimes feel sort of threatened, like, well, if these people are the arbiters of good design and good use of public space, maybe I need to be more like, maybe I need to understand that better. Yeah, a lot of it had to do with design. A lot of it had to do with figuring out what I'm good at and not. And then I would say the underlying worry of all of it that comes up is that I sometimes wonder if I'm the best person to run my own company. (laughs) Like we're growing. I feel good about that. I'm doing a good job, I think. But there are a lot of things that are starting to feel really chaotic, like hiring people quickly or um, changing some big things with operations. Like maybe someone else would be good at doing all of that. And, you know, and that is imposter syndrome because my seven EO mates in the room all said that they all at various points and many of them currently have imposter syndrome. I mean, it's not it's not rare. It's really common depending what profession you're in. And actually, I would say entrepreneurs probably have less imposter syndrome because we're really bold and we're really courageous. And, you know, to you're not going to be overwhelmed with imposter syndrome that, to the point that you aren't going to be an entrepreneur. Like you can still get through it. So, you know, it was a really good presentation. I think it was good to distinguish like where I see myself feeling the imposter syndrome and how can I sort of address it. So very, I'd say definitely very cathartic. You've told us in the past uh, that you've asked yourself whether you're the right person to do this or not. Did going through this uh, process of preparing and giving the presentation affect your thinking on that at all? So I definitely still think I'm the best one to lead my company. I I feel like I have kind of shed that for a little bit. I don't know if this is a fully formed thought, but I'll say it anyways. I feel like if my company keeps growing organically, that I'm going to be really good at my job. But if I got like outside funding or something happened where we really blew up and were huge, I think I would not be good in that situation. And that's good to know because then it's like, okay, well, maybe I'm not always the CEO. Maybe I'm going to become the chief creative officer. I kind of am that in many ways right now. And I love that. Sarah or Jennifer, have either of you thought about this at all? I think no one will love my company more than me. Think of it as I don't know what I'm doing every day, but I will smother it with love. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I will find the answers. It's like when you're a new mother, you you know you love that child more than anything. Do you know all the right answers? And when you see the mom that has four kids, you're like, man, they have it all together, right? Do I know everything? Nope. But I have a vision and a desire and and no one's going to put as much effort and love into this than me. All right. We need to stop. My thanks to Jennifer Karen, Liz Picarazzi, and Sarah Siegel, and to our sponsor, The Great Game of Business, which helps businesses use an open book management system to build healthier companies. You can learn more at greatgame.com. Thanks, everybody. Wait, wait, don't leave yet. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like the 21 Hats owners to address, send it to me by replying to your morning report or by email at lauren at 21hats.com. That's L-O-R-E-N at 21hats.com. Do it now before you forget. And don't be afraid to tell Jay what you really think. He can take it. And if you got something out of this conversation, help us reach more business owners. Tell a friend. Subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to The Morning Report at 21hats.com. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Okay, now you can leave. Thanks for listening, everyone.